A very warm welcome to all of you here tonight. A special welcome to any guests that we have with us this evening. We're glad that uh, you are here, that you have joined us tonight uh, for worship. And I trust that all of us had a, a blessed day, a day truly to rest, a, a day to uh, perhaps reflect a little bit on God's goodness and His grace. And we'll have the opportunity to think about uh, that more together tonight as well. And we're going to start in just a moment doing that by singing about that grace, that amazing grace. But as we enter into worship, God wants to greet his people. W would you please stand to receive his greeting tonight? Well, congregation, God greets us this evening with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. So, Father, we gather in your house tonight, a people saved by grace through faith. God, you are good. You are holy. You are full of might and everlasting love. And tonight we claim that we only put our trust in you. We only put our faith in you, the God who has made us and redeemed us. 
So, God, we pray, enrich our faith tonight. Speak to us through your word. Draw us through your spirit ever closer to you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, I um, love to invite you to say tonight's um, statement of faith with me. This is the Apostles' Creed. Let's say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. I don't know how often that uh, we sing that song here at Graphs Cup. I know in my prior experience, we didn't sing that song a whole lot, not because it's a, a bad song or anything like that. It just seems that people aren't overly familiar with it, but I, I hear it sung well here, and that's awesome because it brings me back. It transports me back some uh, over 20 years ago to my seminary days. And I was in the, the seminary choir, and uh, this was one of our songs. And the tenor part was mine, and I could still sing it. So I was really excited about that, just to sing that song. And I remember we sang that song in, uh, in Canada at uh, some kind of a cathedral. I don't remember specifically, but one of those places where it echoes really good. And it was just such a beautiful song. And what a glorious truth it declares. So we're going to go before our God in prayer, that great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Well, let's go to God together in prayer. Most merciful God and Heavenly Father, Lord, it is so good to be able to gather here in worship like this tonight. And so good to be able to sing our praises, to celebrate the amazing grace that you've given to us, uh, a grace that truly does break every chain, and a grace that sets us free to celebrate that, that gift of your grace and to rejoice in the reality of who you are as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God in three persons and three persons in one God and as as challenging as that is for us to understand and, and ultimately as mysterious as it truly is to know that this is the truth, that this is what Scripture declares, that this is who you are. Father, we rejoice in the reality of who you are and who you have revealed yourself to be, that we know you, that we know you as our dear Father, that we know you as our Savior, that we know you as you, as you continue to work by your Spirit and that, that process of sanctification, that, that road that you have placed us on. Father, by your Spirit, by your power and your grace, becoming more and more like Jesus. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, too, for the, the incredible privilege of prayer and the fact that we can do this as a community now, Father, it's not just in the context of a worship service where we can do that, but it's, it's Wednesday nights that we can gather for prayer. But really, it's, it's any and every time that we, that we seek you out, that you are there, that you're promised that as we seek you, we will find you. God, when we seek you with all of our heart, we are so thankful that this is who you are. Lord, we thank you for another Lord's Day that you've given to us. We thank you for the day of worship that we could enjoy. We thank you for all your many blessings. And we have been so abundantly blessed. Even as we thought about for a moment this morning in the context of the the sermon, just to think about how blessed we truly are, uh, particularly in comparison with so many in the world around us. God, that we take a moment that we say thank you for those blessings that you allow us to truly enjoy those blessings as well. And at the same time, that, that we are ready and willing to be generous with what you have given to us. And whether that's the material blessings that we have or, or even the spiritual blessings that you have, have given to us, that we are generous, that we're ready and willing to share those too. And Father, for the other ways that you bless us, for the relationships that we enjoy even for the the blessings of the nation in which we live, the freedoms that we have. Father, we give you thanks for all of these. We give you thanks for answered prayer. We give you thanks that that Paige is coming home from the hospital tonight, that uh, she has uh, recovered. Uh, She has been granted that restored health to that point where she can come home. And Father, we pray that you continue to bring her back to full health and strength following this uh, appendectomy that she's had to have. Father, too, we give you thanks and praise for for Lottie's daughter and that the cancer numbers are down. This, too, uh, uh, certainly an answer to prayer. Father, we know that you are a God who hears our prayer. You are a God who will respond. And and certainly we recognize it's not always in the way that we would hope, that it's not always a yes, but, but it's always a response. And we are so thankful for that. And just to remember as well that, that you are in charge And that not only are you in charge by your power, but you are in charge by way of your love. Your love for this world and your love for your people. Your love for each one of us. And we thank you for that. Father, we do pray for a variety of other things that we've heard about tonight or things that we're aware of. We do continue to pray for uh, for those recovering from various uh, surgeries or procedures We think of uh, Larry, again, with his shoulder surgery and continue to pray for his full recovery, that that would go well for him. We pray for Evelyn Slager as she continues to receive therapy after a a broken pelvis and pray for that to heal and for the therapy to have its positive effect. We pray for all of those who've recently lost loved ones. We know that, that the list is long, certainly within our congregation, but also connected with our congregation. Father, we pray for each and every one. We've been reminded tonight again of the Hemeke family and 
the sudden and tragic loss of Marissa in a terrible accident. Father, continue to pray for peace and comfort for them, and we continue to be in prayer for Will as he recovers. Father, we ask that you would touch him in a special way and that you would restore to him uh, what has been taken uh, by way of this accident. That, Father, through that, all the glory would go to you. We pray for Sue's family, for her son Mike and the cancer he's recently been diagnosed with, and her grandson Dirk and the cancer in his leg, and grateful to hear that there's been signs of improvement for him. Father, we know it's still a a long road, and we pray that both for for Mike and for Dirk that you would encourage them, uh, that you continue to stand by them and walk with them on this, this path that they are on. Father, we do pray, uh, as uh, was brought up tonight, uh, certainly for our nation, uh, for our Supreme Court and the challenges that it faces from day to day and week to week. Uh, We've been alerted tonight especially to issues with the LGBT community and decisions that will be made by the High Court, and uh, those certainly will be of impact uh, across the nation. So we do pray for, for wisdom for those in our court Father, we think, too, of uh, just uh, all of those who serve in in positions of authority over us, uh, whether that's our our local leaders or even uh, those in a national level, our president and such. Uh, We think of all of them, and we pray for each one, even as Scripture calls us to, whether we agree with them politically or not, but we are to pray for them. Because, Father, we recognize that, uh, that a peaceful government means peaceful lives, And so more and more, we do pray for that peace. And and certainly not only in our nation, but in the world around us too. And we are well aware of the situation that has been developing in in Turkey and Syria and all the impact there in the Middle East. Father, we are greatly concerned with this. Father, we continue to pray uh, for your will to be done and uh, for your kingdom to continue to come. Father, even as I was uh, milling around the the lobby before church and talking to various people, uh, we think of of those uh, uh, farmers in our community as well. We know that the harvest time is upon us, and we pray for good weather for that, drier weather, uh, that the things that need to be done could be done. Father, we thank you already for the, the wonderful blessing of the harvest that you will give us. Father, for all of these things, these things that have been mentioned, these things that perhaps we we keep uh, hidden in our heart, but yet they are of great concern, and for even the the notes of thanksgiving and praise that that we have, too, in our hearts, Father, to know that, uh, that you know each one of us better than we know ourselves, that you know our thoughts before we think them and our words before we speak them. Now, Father, if for some reason we can't even form those words, that, that your Spirit intercedes for us with, with groans that words cannot even express. And we're so thankful for that. Father, as we continue in our service tonight, as we look to give of our gifts in just a moment, as we look into your word, as we listen to, uh, to your truth for us tonight, we pray that we would have uh, spirits that are, are ready and willing to hear that we would hear lives that are are willing to be transformed by your power, that we would be willing to go forth into this week as you have laid it out for us, and that we would want to live for you, that we would be uh, not afraid to to stand out as as different, and that people we would be able to see that within us and want to know what that's all about, and that we would be able to share Jesus. Father, we... We give the rest of our time to you, certainly, and we thank you for it. And we pray that always and only in Jesus' name and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Now, this time we do have the opportunity to give of our gifts. The offering uh, tonight is for the Christian Education Opportunity Fund right here at Grafscop. So may we give as God leads us to do that this evening. Friends, would you rise as we sing?
Well, thanks, Noah, for the choices in music tonight. And I don't know, maybe you called the old choir director I had or something at seminary because that was another one of those songs that we sang. And I still like to pick out that tenor part there. That's really neat. Well, I want to invite you, uh, if you'd like, to take out your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We're just going to look at one verse tonight there. So if you just want to listen, that's fine, too. Uh, But I think we're very familiar with Hebrews chapter 11. It is that great faith chapter where over and over again we read by faith, by faith, whether that was by faith Abel or by faith Abraham or by faith Moses and so forth. And I would invite you to read uh, the balance of this chapter maybe later on tonight or sometime this week uh, just to uh, even get a greater context of what we're thinking about today, but I, uh, tonight. But I think that most of us are familiar with this chapter, and really what we want to focus in on uh, is verse 1. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight, uh, according to uh, where we are in the catechism, about true faith. True faith. And so Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, just that verse is where we want to concentrate our attentions here this evening. So I'll read that quickly for us a moment. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I just want to pause there for a moment. Just let that sink in just a little bit. Listen to it one more time. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So just keep that right here in the forefront of your mind as we, as we consider our topic for tonight. And I did mention we're going to be looking at Lord's Days uh, 7 and 8 of the Catechism. Uh, much of the, those questions and answers are going to be on the screen. Not every single word. Sometimes it doesn't all fit. So you might want to have your Uh, your Heidelberg Catechism out. You can find that in the back of those gray Psalter hymnals. And we're here beginning on page 867. So page 867 in the back of those gray hymnals. You'll find uh, Lord's Days at 7 and 8 right around those pages there. So as we, as we head into things tonight, I think most of us are, are well aware that for the past few weeks, we have been involved in this study uh, of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's an overview study, to be sure. We, we understand that. Uh, it's a study entitled, as you see there on the screen behind me, Questions Worth Answering. And tonight, just to kind of uh, give us an idea, this is the fourth uh, piece of that study, the fourth uh, lesson Uh, In that study, I'm hoping, I'm planning to have 10 all together. So if we think about that, you know, we're almost halfway through already, right? We're going to be tonight lesson four, and we're only on Lord's Day seven and eight, which means for the first three, we've only been through one through six out of 52. 
So we've obviously got some ground to cover, right? And so we, we really want to do that tonight. And although Lord's Day 7 and 8, we're going to be looking at those questions and answers particularly tonight, but effectually, after we get done for tonight, we're going to be all the way through Lord's Day 22, and, and really going to uh, kind of touch on that a little bit more next Sunday as we, as we again look at a, a similar topic as the Catechism presents it. But in any event, tonight, again, our topic is true faith. And very specifically, as you can see on those message outlines, if you've got them out, we're going to touch on two things. Number one, what true faith is, and number two, what true faith believes. However, before we turn our attention very specifically to Lord's Day 7 and 8, I want to make sure that we locate ourselves in the catechism once again. Right? I want to make sure we know exactly where we're at, because context is always really important. And so with respect to those three main sections of the catechism, right? we, we know them generally as sin, salvation, and service, or if we want to use G words, it's all about guilt and grace and gratitude. Within that, within those three sections here, Lord's Day 7 and 8 fall squarely and firmly within that second section, right? So we're in the second section of salvation or grace. And that's important for us to know because what it means is that we've already made our way through that first main section, right? And that was a section that made it very, very clear that each and every one of us, all of us as human beings, any human being born into this planet from Adam and Eve on, that we are sinners, right? So we know that we are sinners, and that on account of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. They were humanity's representatives. They're in the garden when they sin. Now sin has entered the human experience. So all of us are stained with sin. This is a sin that we cannot deal with in and of ourselves. It's a sin that separates us from God. And it makes it impossible for us to experience and to enjoy an intimate fellowship with God, which is exactly what he created humanity, exactly what he created you and me for. And that finally, it's a sin that ultimately leads to our death and to eternal punishment. But we ha as we've already learned, because we've already entered into this second main section here, We've learned that God was unwilling to leave us in our sin. And so he determined to make a way for our sins to be forgiven. And that way, as Lord's Days 5 and 6 reminded us, was none other than the sacrifice of his own son. The one who is our perfect mediator. Remember that term we used? Our perfect mediator. Because he is true God and he is true man at exactly the same time. And therefore, he is the only one who can bridge that gap between God and us and bring us back into a right relationship with God once again. So all of that leads us up to where we find ourselves tonight and this topic of true faith. And it's obviously a very important topic because even as Lord's Day 7 tells us right out of the gate, right in the very first question and answer there, it says only those are saved who by true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all of his blessings. And so in other words, we're told right off the bat that, that although the fall of humanity was universal, salvation is not. Right? It is not the case that, that all are stained with sin because of Adam and therefore automatically all are saved because of Christ. That's not it. All are not saved through Christ just as all was lost through Adam. One person put it this way, redemption is not a right but a blessing. And without faith, we are dead in trespasses and sins. So this is an important topic that the catechism brings up for us. It's an important topic for us to think about tonight. So with that in mind, let's get into the, then the first thing. What constitutes true faith? What is true faith? And question and answer 21 there of Lord's Day 7 puts it out for us like this. True faith is not only a knowledge and conviction 
that everything God reveals in his word is true, but it is also a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that out of sheer grace earned for us by Christ, not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven, have been made right with God, and have been granted salvation. Now, that's a a beautiful answer. I mean, it's almost poetic in nature. And maybe for some of you, it brings you back, at least if you're my age or older, it brings you back to your high school catechism days, right? When we used to study the Heidelberg Catechism, thankfully, we're, you know, we're doing that again. But we used to study it, and we used to be commanded to commit some to memory. Remember that question and answers? And so many of you very likely had question and answer one that you committed to memory, but many of you also may have had question and answer 21 committed to memory. What is true faith? It's a beautiful answer. But what does it mean? Right? What does it mean? What really is true faith? What constitutes true faith? Well, essentially, as this answer brings to light for us, true faith is both comprehension and confidence. That is to say, true faith involves our head, but it also involves our hearts. Right? True faith is not, it's not only something we know, but it's also something that we feel. And the author of Hebrews gets at that right here in, in verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, right? The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Or if you're like me and you you hear Hebrews 11 verse 1 and you can only hear the NIV, right? Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. So that's the essence of it. Right? It's both head and heart. So digging into that a little bit deeper, what that means is is when it comes to faith, there are certain things that we need to know. There are certain things we need to know. Certain things we need to know about God. Certain things we need to know about the gospel. Things that the Bible tells us. So we need to know that we're sinners. We need to know that we cannot save ourselves. We need to know that God sent Jesus, his one and only son, into this world to deal with our sin. We need to know that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price of our sin, and that's a price that you and I and any other human being could never pay. We need to know that Jesus rose from the grave three days later to secure our salvation. We need to know all of that. To use a word out of Hebrews 11 here, verse 1, we need to be certain about that. It's a conviction. We know that because that's what the Bible says. That's what the the truth that God's word presents to us. However, as the catechism reminds us here, head knowledge isn't enough. Remember what James says? Look in James, in his New Testament letter, in chapter 2, verse 19, it says, when it comes to good theology, even the demons have that. Right? Even they know these things about Jesus. Even they know these things about God. So good theology isn't enough. It's not just about the head, but it's also about the heart. Right? So our hearts need to be engaged as well. There needs to be this, this deep-rooted assurance Right? There needs to be this personal certainty that not only do I know that Jesus came to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, but Jesus died for me. That in Jesus, my sins are forgiven. That in Jesus, I have eternal life. That God just doesn't love the world, but God loves me. 
That's what we're talking about here. That's the personal certainty. And as the catechism makes very clear, this personal certainty, this deep-rooted assurance, it is not something that you and I can just generate within ourselves, right? If only we think hard enough that we'll generate it in ourselves. No. That is something that's only created within us by the Holy Spirit. Paul touches on that in Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. At one point he says, it's the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit, God's Spirit, who testifies with our small s spirit that we are his children. And therefore, he goes on to say, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. It's the Spirit who testifies with our spirit. The Spirit creates within us this deep rooted assurance. That's the essence of true faith. It involves both our head and our heart. Maybe this will help, maybe it won't, but I'll give it to you anyway. I ran across this recently. One commentator compared true faith with water. Water, as we know, is made up of two distinct elements, right? Hydrogen and oxygen. One alone is hydrogen gas. The other alone is an oxygen atom. So with just one or the other, you don't have water, but together you do. He says it's the same thing when it comes to the elements of true faith, right? This certain knowledge and this sure confidence. One alone, it's just just intellectual assent. The other alone is just raw emotion. right? Separately, independently of each other, you don't have true faith. But when they come together by God's grace, then you do. So Lord's Days 7 and 8 move on from that point. They go on to, to ask us and to tell us really about the content of true faith. So the follow-up question here is, well, what then must a Christian believe? In our head and our heart, what must a Christian believe? Believe, And the answer essentially is the gospel, right? Which as the catechism very clearly indicates here, it's not just the story of Jesus, right? That's when we say gospel, that's often what we think. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, any one of them or all of them together. But he says, it's not just the gospel here. The, The gospel is not just those books. It's not just the story of Jesus. It is the entire story of God from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22, which is wonderfully summarized for us in the Apostles' Creed, right? Which, as the Catechism calls it, a creed beyond doubt and confessed throughout the world. And I think it's a fairly fair statement to say that even if you haven't heard of the Heidelberg Catechism, maybe you're visiting here tonight and the Heidelberg Catechism sounds to you like I'm speaking Well, I'd say German, but it actually is German, so I'll say Greek. It sounds like I'm talking Greek or something. And you don't know what the Heidelberg Catechism is. Even if that's you, very likely you would know what the Apostles' Creed is. Because it is by far the most ecumenical of all the creeds in the greater Christian community. Right, virtually any Bible-believing, Jesus-professing church you could go to, not just here you know, in our nation, but really across the globe, they would readily confess the words of the Apostles' Creed. We, we did so tonight, and we do so regularly, and rightly so. Now, because we said it together earlier, I'm not going to go through it again. I'm not going to recite it here once again. It's laid out for there in Lord's Day 7. You can see that. But suffice it to say, the creed lays out for us in 12 relatively brief statements the essential doctrines of Christianity. And they are doctrines that revolve around, even as Lord's Day 8 describes it for us, God the Father and our creation, God the Son and our deliverance, and God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. Now, for many of us, that it doesn't knock us off our bench or anything like that. We're, we're familiar with that. But maybe what we don't often appreciate is the Trinitarian nature here of this creed. In fact, as one person put it, he said, if any doctrine makes Christianity Christian, then surely it is the doctrine of the Trinity. 
Now, as you can imagine, we could spend an awful lot of time talking about the Trinity. We really could. I mean, entire books have been written on the doctrine of the Trinity, right? We could spend a lot of time on this tonight, and it really is a fascinating thing to think about. Maybe sometime we we can dig a, a little bit deeper into it, but It's not really what we want to do tonight. I don't want to spend tonight uh, talking about an explanation for the Trinity or uh, or even um, uh, a defense of the Trinity, although I just would tell you that scripturally, the Trinity can be very well defended. And I would tell you as well that logically, the Trinity can be very well explained. But we're not going to get into that particularly tonight. What, What I'd rather focus on for just a moment here is what makes the doctrine of the Trinity so significant, right? Even beyond the fact that of all the religions of the world, only Christianity understands God in this way, right? As Lord's Day 8 goes on to explain it for us, that here in God we have one true eternal God who has revealed himself as three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? One in three, three in one. What makes this doctrine so significant? And I just want to give us a little food for thought on that. First of all, when we understand that God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit, then that means we're recognizing the reality that in Jesus, God himself came to be among us. God himself. Not someone who was just merely God-like. Not someone who was close, but not quite. But God himself in all of his fullness. In Jesus. That he came and he lived among us. And it reminds me even of what we talked about just a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Lord's Days 5 and 6 to understand how important it is that Jesus is not only fully human, but he is also fully divine in some mysterious way at exactly the same time. But how important that is, because if he wasn't, then our redemption would not have been possible. He couldn't have done it. So we recognize that reality, number one. But we also recognize the reality that in the Holy Spirit, God himself continues to be with us all the time, wherever we are. And he's leading us, and he's guiding us, and he's, he's comforting us, right? Through all of the, the twists and turns of life, all of the, the hills and the valleys. You see, what it comes down to is this. Without the doctrine of the Trinity, God would just be some detached deity. He'd be cold and, and callous. But because God has revealed himself to us as Father Son, and Holy Spirit. He has made himself not only available to us, but approachable. And that is exactly the God we need. And that is exactly the God whom Scripture declares. True faith, what it is, and what it believes. Hopefully we've cleared that up a little bit. But even more to the point, it's my prayer that true faith is exactly what each one of us has. True faith in the true God, true faith of head and heart, in the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because you see, nothing more is needed. 
and nothing less will suffice. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to, to learn, to dig in a little bit deeper to what your word tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 1. We, we know this verse well, but sometimes we, we just say it and it runs right through our lips and we really don't think about what it's saying about faith. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. True faith is about our head and our heart. Both needs to be there. And that's by your grace. And to, uh, to re be reminded of what true faith believes as it's summarized for us in the Apostles' Creed. Those words that we have said over and over again many times as believers. But to stop and to think again how amazing it is that you are three in one and one in three. That you are the unique, the only, the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That true faith in the true God is what we need. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't have that tonight, we pray that you would work in their hearts by your Spirit. There are those who are questioning that tonight, that you would do the same. That, Father, ultimately you would bring all of us to the point that we can say, as it comes out of our mouths, but it originates in our head and in our hearts, this I believe, and to give you thanks and praise. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you rise if you're able? Forgiveness is in you, descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son.
Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus for I believe in the name of Jesus for I believe in the name of Jesus and all God's people said amen, amen. Before we close uh, in singing, God gives to us his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.